Um, members will note that the meeting will include today's meeting will include briefings on SIs, the fisheries uh, trade negotiations, fisheries EU exit regulations, and a number of department written briefings. Uh, we have Patsy Morris and uh, Claire on, on Starleaf here. You're very welcome. And as you, as we know, the committee will broadcast through Parliament buildings <coughs> online and mobile devices. You can use them as long as they're in airplane mode. We have no apologies in today, and. Uh, we've, uh, uh, I want you to refer to you as a copied email on the committee rooms layered on page 48 of the table packs, um, of the table papers. Uh, I want to advise members that the Assembly Building Services have recently completed a review of the capacity in committee meeting rooms to ensure that social distancing guidelines can be followed. Members will note from the email that room 30, this is our normal meeting room, uh, now has the capacity to hold a maximum of 12 people. The email also contains a copy of the suggested room layout and clearly shows where seats uh, are to be arranged in order to maintain the two-metre distance. Starley facility will remain, uh, still remains and its, its use is encouraged especially for witnesses. I want to invite members that the informal meeting with the House of Lords EU subcommittee has been arranged for Tuesday 6th of October at 1pm and will take place on Microsoft Teams. And the invite for this has already been issued and the information pack will issue in due course. I seek agreement to forward the hands of the committee session on the ETS Common Framework to our sister committees in Westminster, Scotland and Wales and to the Economy Committee. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, I want to refer to members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 24th September, 6 to 11. Can I get that agreement for me to sign the um, minutes? That's okay. Um, Okay, I can refer members to the committee's request for legal advice as agreed at last week's meeting on the process the committee has been asked to follow in the, as consideration of the SIs. They're in table papers 10 to 13. Please note that the papers are marked uh, restricted and legally privileged and should therefore not be shared um, or, or indeed quoted from them. Can I ask members to note the legal advice we brought to the committee in due course? Okay. Okay. Are we all have we all left the legal advice as yet? It's in the table papers. It's, it's a request for legal advice. We haven't received it yet. Haven't received it yet. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, uh, written briefing, the office from the office of the speaker. I want to refer members to correspondence from the clerk assistant on the committee consideration in relation to EU exit SAs. It's on page 15 to 19. And correspondence from the speaker, um, including a copy of the TEO guidance. Uh, can I ask members to note paragraph 19 on page 17 of the pack? This states that the role of the committee is not to carry out scrutiny of the draft SIs. Instead, committees are considering the Minister's proposal that a government, uh, the UK government should make an SIE that applies to here on the devolved matter. In doing so, the committee should consider whether the proposed amendment is necessary and whether an SI is SA is appropriate legislative vehicle as opposed to an SR which goes through the Assembly. Um, the memo goes on at paragraph 25 on page 18 suggests that while ideally committees will be able to take a position on whether they support the Minister's position or not, where insufficient time or information has not been provided, committees may wish to record this as their position. Um, uh, Philip? Uh, thanks Chair. Just in uh, paragraph 20 it says the Civil Service guidance makes clear that, the, that due to the position of the NIO, department should not provide committees with copies of draft SA. I mean, what, A, what is the position of the NIO and B, what is their role uh, in this uh, in terms of us as a committee doing our uh, duty, uh, scrutinising all of this? Yeah. I will write and ask. Yeah. Is this a proposal for us to write to the department to write to the NIO or the department, DERA? I'd, I'd be DERA or TEO, yeah. Yeah, to just clarify that. Okay, yeah. yep. Yeah. What paragraph is that again? The, or paragraph 20. 20, yeah. Okay. Yeah, paragraph 20. Um, okay, members. Um, okay, we're going to receive an oral briefing uh, from DERA on AGS 04 and AGS five uh, um, and on your papers it's the department officials note is page 40 to 48 the clerk from the the memo from the clerk at 49 to 52 uh, and again at 53 to 55 
and there's correspondence in the department at 58 to 60. Um, and the summary of the changes made by the SAEs at 51 to 62. They recall that the departmental officials had briefed the committee on the SAEs at last week's meeting. However, we did not have enough time to consider them. This was in part because the officials were trying to provide detailed and technical information orally rather than providing it in a written briefing. I'm glad to see that the speaking notes have been provided to us today at page 40. Uh, can I ask you to note that DEFRA planned to lay SAE's DEFRA AGS04 uh, had planned to lay it yesterday. This means that the committee opportunity for comment has now passed. Therefore, now we plan to lay the devolved SA AGS 05 early next week, although the precise laying date is yet to be confirmed. The officials uh, have joined us today uh, again today and will answer questions that we may have. So I'd like to welcome on to Starleaf uh, Colette McMaster, the Director of Sustainable Agri Food Development, and Elaine McCrory, Head of Agri Food uh, Brexit. Um, okay. and I want to remind members. I just want to remind members that um, that the these uh, SAs, um, common market, of uh, common organisation of the markets and agricultural products um, regulation 2020 is reserved. But we're not being asked for our opinion on the SA. It's provided for information only, and because it has implications for other the other SA AGS 05. Um, the department has stated that it would be helpful if the committee could consider the uh, and provide its views on the content of the devolved just, essay. Just pull the officials in now. Okay. Okay, um, could we ask for the, the uh, commission, the, the officials to come in now, please? Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, it's Colette McMaster here, Chair, so um, if you're content, um, I'll start. Okay, it was an introduction. So thank you for the opportunity to return to the committee on the devolved SI, the agriculture payments amendment, etc., EU exit regulations referred to as AGS05. As I said last Thursday, we're seeking the committee's agreement that the provisions in this SI should be extended to Northern Ireland. I'm aware that members have the written briefing provided on this SI. I understand you also have a copy of the oral presentation that I made last week, and I hope that's helpful. With your permission, Chair, I'll give a quick recap of the key points of the SI before questions. Firstly, on territorial extent, AGS05 is drafted on a UK-wide basis. This is because it amends earlier EU exit SIs that were made by DEFRA as UK-wide legislation, and it would be problematic to legislate for Northern Ireland separately. This also creates a consistent approach to common issues and makes efficient use of resources across the four nations. Simply, it would not be possible to have standalone Northern Ireland legislation made by the 31st of December. AGS05 addresses operability issues in retained EU and domestic legislation to reflect the withdrawal agreements, as well as updating previous exit SIs to correct errors and terminology. It ensures that the EU regulations dealing with governance of former CAP funding schemes will operate after transition. It makes operability amendments to EU legislation, which was incorporated into UK law as of exit day, and amended to make direct payment schemes operable in 2020. This SI strips out any references to direct payments in previous exit SIs, as these are included in separate legislation already in force. It makes technical amendments that will have little practical effect on the operation of the Rural Development Regulation and Common Market Organisation schemes, such as school milk, but it will ensure that the legislation continues to function effectively after transition it also provides powers for DERA for to fund and carry out checks on producer organisations. The SI also includes a few other technical amendments to earlier exit SIs. By way of update, AGS05 was not laid yesterday as previously planned. It's now due to be laid in draft form early next week. We also brought a reserve SI in to the committee's attention. Can update the committee? This SI has been led in draft form yesterday, as DA consent was not required. To sum up, changes made by AGS05 are technical amendments to ensure relevant legislation can operate at the end of transition. 
Subject to the committee's views, the Minister is minded to give consent to extending the provisions in ADS 05 to Northern Ireland. We asked a number of questions last week. Ian and I are happy to take any further questions you'd like to ask. Thank you. Um, thank you for that there uh, briefing, uh, Colette. Um, I suppose um, I, I should say that within the wider context of the SA process, um, you know, members of the committee here feel almost uh, no uncomfortable because the, the, the it, it, it's very difficult for us to scrutinise. And I understand you, yourselves are working at pace as well. This is coming at yourselves um, like a like a train. And I, I note even comments made by the Speaker of the House over in Westminster this morning where, where he highlighted the, the, the misuse of SIs in the case of um, Prime Minister. Um, and this is undermining uh, parliamentary scrutiny. So th this is a really, really challenging process. And I suppose in relation to, uh, for example, the uh, AG SO4, you know, Vera doesn't dispute that that's a reserved matter, but could you tell me what's the view of the, the Scottish Parliament in relation to that one, would you know? Um, sir, I can't comment on the detail of what the Scottish um, Parliament's view is on it. Um, I know that they have disputed aspects of the reserved nature of that SI. The, the SI, as I've said, that particular one, a reserved one, doesn't require DA consent um, for, for the DEFRA um, have laid it. And that's actually what, what did happen yesterday. Um, it was laid in draft form at Westminster um, without DA consent, which was not requested because it's reserved. Um, but uh, there is, um, I mean, I'm not sure just what the conclusion of the, the Scottish Parliament has been on that. Um, our own um, assessment of it from a legal perspective is that we don't, we don't dispute the reserved nature of that reserved SI. And there's no formal consultation that's taken place in relation to this AG SO5? AG SO5, um, there is no formal consultation on the AG SO5. There was um, some previous consultation by DEFRA at an earlier stage on this, and um, in 2018, and uh, they, as part of the preparation for the laying of EU legislation, DEFRA ran um, a, a targeted stakeholder engagement as, aspect of exercise on aspects of the Common Market Organisation. So there, there was some consultation that stage. There's been no further consultation on AGSO5. Um, the reason DEFRA have for that is there is no statutory requirement to do so, and there are no policy options now in which to seek the stakeholders. Um, Philip? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree, uh, Chair, with your dissatisfaction of the process. Uh, I mean, in terms of why it's an SI and not an SR. I mean, could we get some clarification on that and what would happen if the committee indicated that we would prefer a legislative route for these provisions uh, made in the Assembly? Okay, um, so it is an SI. Um, it's not an SI because um, as, well, the rationale for it being an SI is that this is UK-wide legislation. It's, uh, it's UK-wide legislation. Um, it amends earlier EU exit SIs that were made by DEFRA as UK-wide legislation. And for that reason, it's amending UK-wide legislation, say GSO5. It's also ensuring um, this approach in terms of what was previously UK-wide legislation ensures a, a consistent approach to common issues. Um, it's also, it, it really is also about making efficient use of resources. Um, at this stage, um, our assessment is that if we were to seek to remove Northern Ireland from the, uh, the SI, that we would not have time to have the to have standalone legislation in place in Northern Ireland before the 31st of December, which then runs the risk of um, the operability of our, our 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 schemes in Northern Ireland, um, so 
that sort of summarizes the, the key rationale around this one. Okay. William? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, in effect, I see the changes at conclusion. To sum up, the changes that are made by the devolved SI AGS5 are necessary to ensure EU can retain law in relation to finance and monitoring and monitoring of CMO and RDP schemes, as well as some aspects of the schemes themselves function effectively. In effect, this is necessary for the change on the thirty on the first of January, isn't that right? For able to function properly, yeah. Yeah, this this is. I mean, the amendments in here are largely technical. Um, they're a necessary consequence of the UK's withdrawal from the EU. Um, they're needed to make to allow the the legislation to allow the schemes to function effectively. Um, there, there, there may be implications. If it's not in place in transition, it could potentially affect ultimately affect our DARA's ability to pay beneficiaries. Um, so, in in sort of summary terms, it is it is primarily about making technical amendments. Um, and but if those aren't made, then that could impact on the functionality of the legislation in Northern Ireland. Absolutely. Okay, that's clear for me. Yeah. Okay, Colette, well, uh, the last thing we want to see is any negative impact on the level of payments that you know, our farming and wetter our communities get, because we know when we were scrutinising the agriculture bill, we heard from uh, Dr. Gravy and Dr. Dobbs that at least thirty percent of our farms here in the north. Would uh, would disappear if they didn't have the type of support. So, seeing the absence of the legs of this um, SA being rule proofed, you know, is the department content that it will not have any uh, detrimental impact on the social and economic um, well-being of um, our rural farming and rural communities? Um, okay, so we have. Um Yes, it has not been rule approved because it's been made by Whitehall Minister, so they have not, they don't um, carry out rural needs assessments under the Rural Needs Act. However, we have considered, we have considered as a department as to whether any of the provisions might have negative rural impacts. Um, given the amount, that the amendments in this SI are largely technical and they're a necessary consequence of the UK's withdrawal from the EU, it's not foreseen that this legislation will have any specific impacts on the needs of, of rural dwellers. Um, as, I, as I said previously, there um, the implications there would be for more implications for rural dwellers if the legislation is not made by the end of transition, as the legislation not being in place could potentially affect our ability, for example, to pay beneficiaries. Yeah. Um... I, thank you very much. And I was just looking at um, the SI in relation to the protocol, and what manner might that impact on the internal market bill, or the internal market bill impact on it? Okay. Um, in terms of the the protocol, first of all. Yes. Um, protocol. Yeah. Okay. So under the terms of the protocol. Northern Ireland will continue to be bound by EU regulations covering certain goods until such time as the Northern Ireland Executive democratically decides to leave that arrangement. Um, there, we talked about two um, SIs when we, we came last week. Um, I'll focus today on the AGS05, the devolved one. Um, AGS05 makes minor amendments to legislation regarding funding schemes which are largely out with the protocol and intersect with devolved policy. Uh, so the, that, that is the area where the, this legislation, the matters in this legislation in terms of devolved matters are out with the protocol. Then, I mean, I did touch on the, the reserved, the reserved matter um, previously. I'll, I'll, I'll just mention that, although it's, that's not really focused on the discussion today, but AGS 04 includes some content on geographical indications, appeals procedure, procedures that reflect the protocol um, and would only apply to decisions made by DEFRA Secretary of State in relation to the protection of GIs and GB, and GIs are a reserve matter. 
then I think you've asked as well about the impact of the internal market bill and what that might have on our our schemes, our common market organisations here. So the expenditure under the CMO and the rural development and direct payments to farmers may be covered in any UK subsidy control regime. And the bill reserves the powers to the UK government in relation to the UK subsidy control regime, but it doesn't create one. Um, the issue of what controls will be on subsidies in the UK will be subject to consultation on a later date. So it's really in terms of EU state aid rules. EU state aid rules will continue to apply in Northern Ireland, which will include a limit on the amount of support that can, can be given to our farmers. Our interest is that state aid and GB is not more generous or trade distorting compared to what can be provided in Northern Ireland in order to avoid Headedness of our business, the GB market being adversely yeah. Okay. Um, Padze? And uh, on the issue of state aid, it did, did raise it previously, but I'm not going that direction. Es essentially, with a lot of these instruments and legislation, we're basically, the practices we've been asked to note these, really. Isn't that right, Claire? Because this particular one I did five, because it's a default matter, DA consent requested to um, make to lay the, the SIs in Westminster because they're covering UK wide matters, that some of which are devolved. So in this case, just under in line with the the procedure, um, Minister has been asked to agree to the territorial extent or to give his consent to the territorial extent. And he's looking the views of the committee on that um, to inform his final decision. So that's where we're seeking the committee's views on extending that territorial extent to include Northern Ireland in this SI. Okay, and what what weight is due to be given by the committee view on any issue? Well, the minister will. We'll take the point of the committee's view. Okay. Now, um, secondly, just if I could ask, please, um, you may or may not be aware that um, now I don't expect you to give an answer on this. Certainly, don't expect you to give an answer. Uh, uh, the the EU is announcing probably in about an hour's time that they're launching legal action uh, against Britain on the internal market bill and uh, the withdrawal agreement and the potential for clashes between the two. So. Um, I'm not asking you for an answer. That would be stupid of me to ask that, and it would maybe be inappropriate of you to answer it, uh, given that we don't know the basis of what the legal action is in the first instance. Um, but presumably the department will be taking advice on that and the potential implications and ramifications for our situation here as, as we uh, look at the both protocol and how... The, the North here is being affected by all of this. So um, I'm just, I'm presuming that the department will be looking at that. No, all I'm asking is to, to confirm that. Maybe, maybe I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not in a position to confirm that as, as you'll, you'll appreciate. Um, yeah. In terms of the SSI, I suppose it's, it's getting back to um, what we explained about the, the purpose of the, these SIs, and they're part of the 2020 legislative program aimed at ensuring a functioning statute book yes. at the end of the transition period, 31st of December. So I suppose, to a sense, this, 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 this continues and this needs to continue in any case. But, uh, sorry, I won't labour this. Maybe you're not in a position to answer yes or no, but, but I presume the department will be uh, watching the development in Europe, between Europe and GB, and the Westminster government and seeing and keeping a very close watch on what the legal ramifications of that could be because we, we don't like to think that all or some of what we're doing would be just rendered null and void. Um, so I presume the department will be taking advice upon these matters. Uh, maybe you're not in a position to, to answer about that. Um, I, I, I'm not in a position to, to answer you on that. But um, what I don't see that having any, I see this, this 
having a, stat a functioning statutory um, rule book being something that we need in any case in Northern Ireland. Um, so it's if you set, a, set aside the, the, the concerns of clearly that you have about the internal market bill, so, uh, which is the purpose of this legislative program that we're we're discussing currently. So it's it's in, it's so that we have um, a functioning rulebook in place in Northern Ireland by the end of uh, the transition period. On this ground, um, maybe you could reflect just, well, my concerns, and there may be others in the committee that have that, just that the department keep a very close watching brief on, on legal matters as they roll out. Um, that'll be very important. Um, okay, thanks very much for that, Claire. Okay, thank you for that. Anybody else? Okay, okay then, the, the question for the committee is, if we are content for the minister to give consent for the, the UK Minister to lay a statutory instrument in the uh, Parliament on the Agriculture um, Payment Amendment Regulation 2020. And uh, just before we discuss it, we do this, I want to remind members that we have choices. We can say that we are content uh, for this. We can say that we are opposed to the proposal, uh, either on its own merit, because we believe that uh, there's that that if there is to be any such legislation, it should be a statutory rule made by the Minister here. And or the committee does not, we can decide the committee doesn't believe we have sufficient information or time to make an informed decision and we may, may wish to either to oppose or not to take a position at all. Um, so and if, we want, if we want any comments or issues we wish to draw to, we can, we can uh, we can outline any comments or issues we want to draw to the attention of the ministers. So, um, Minister, so if any comments that we wish to raise in our letter in response to the minister, Andira? I think this makes common sense. I think this, this committee is doing something. I've been in this committee for 13, 14 years. Some people in this committee don't accept we're leaving Europe. You know, that's above our heads. We are leaving Europe. And I think. It's sad that the committee's playing politics. We, for 14 years in this committee, politics wasn't played, but I see it more and more every day I come here. I think it's sad. I mean, these are tactical in major, in nature. They need to be, they're continuing. They're, they're, they're putting something in place to ensure the payments and everything can continue as normal after the 1st of January. I can't see an issue with that. And uh, my party has no issue with that. I think it's, it's a sad day that when this committee start to play politics. I, I agree, they may, may not as much time as we'd like, but this is pretty simple and straightforward. These, <laughs> these, are, simple, these are simple and straightforward. Anyone who says they're not, not the honest. I just don't want to be clear that I don't think we're playing politics because... Well, there's absolutely no doubt about it. But in the correspondence outlined us that we got there's here at actually, from, from actually... Uh, we, we said that we have options to oppose support or else say we haven't been sufficient time to not make a decision. Well, we, th that's I can't that's see any reason why we wouldn't, couldn't support that. Uh, well, this is Philip. I don't, think, I don't think you could unless you're playing politics. Well, I can see plenty of reasons why uh, the committee might come up with a different view. I mean, uh, From a political reason, yeah. I think it's interesting that William jumped in and started talking about politics before anybody had actually made any commentary. You already made plenty of comments on it. So, so I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think uh, uh, that from, from my point of view, I mean, this isn't an issue about Brexit. I mean, we all have our own uh, political views about Brexit. This is quite clearly about this committee being able to do its job that it was tasked to do, which is scrutinise legislation, scrutinise changes to legislation, and scrutinise things in the best interest of the the people that we represent. And in this case, within the agriculture sector. So, I mean, I don't I mean I don't know what what William had for breakfast this morning, but that's certainly not playing politics. That's us doing our job. I think it is clear from all of the discussions that we have had, and I mean, I mean William can ask the same of people in Scotland and, and Wales, because they, in some cases they're taking uh, the viewpoint, uh, and, and even as the Chair pointed out this morning, the Speaker of the House in Westminster made a point uh, yesterday about the, this SI process and the Boris Johnson and his Tory government trying to rub shot over uh, politicians, because we can talk about politics, we are politicians, our job is to be involved in politics, but having the, the correct time and procedure uh, and 
process for doing all of this. So in basis of all of that, in basis of the fact that we're receiving information, short time periods, but we can't do, do the proper scrutiny. I mean, I, I, I don't think there's, I mean, I would have any opportunity or option than to say we don't, didn't have enough time to scrutinise this properly and do our job properly. And that's what I'd be proposing. Okay. Any other? Rosemary? Yeah. Certainly, I would have. T I would have uh, co uh, concerns sometimes. Uh, concern in relation to some of the scrutinising that we have to do in such a short time. But there are certainly other SIs that really do not affect us so much here, and we could near enough get pass them through on pass them through without. Time. We don't need the time, but there are others that we certainly do need to scrutinise. I would agree with you, Just add, uh, Chair, I'd be content because I don't want anything to jeopardise the future payments to our farmers. That's the bottom line, really. Thank you. Okay, so what uh, we seem to have different opinion here <coughs> whether um, Philip is, is proposing that. Um, you know, that we take the position as outlined to us that, that by the uh, you know, that we have available to us in terms of uh, we haven't sufficient time to reach an informed view and we neither support nor oppose just like that. I, mean, I think that point's clear. I mean, this isn't about playing politics. My proposal isn't making a, a, a decision one way or the other on the SA. We don't want the impact. Uh, payments to the farmers. M my, my proposal is based on the fact that we just do not have a time to look at this in the detail that we would like to, or that I would like to. Mr Chairman, I just think there's nothing major in these, uh, this SI that, that we, we, we're nitpicking, I think, but that, that's, that's my view, but uh, the position of my position is that we should accept them. Uh, we don't we were voting we were voting in. Accepting that my party will be in. Okay. I think farmers will take farmers and the, the local industry will take will take a different view. I can understand if there's some major issue in these that there was issues that we hadn't time to scrutinise or we weren't happy with. I don't think there's anything in these SIs is in any way controversial. Straightforward, simple, and I think we're not picking on this issue. Okay. Claire. Claire. Chair? Thanks, Chair. Can I just also put on record that I um, am certainly not playing politics with this, and I think it has been made abundantly clear um, that we have not been given um, sufficient time to scrutinise um, and work through the, the detail of these, um, and I think that it's shocking for that claim to be even made. Um, but if this SI, I mean, the committee position on this SI, can I just clarify, makes no difference on whether this passes or not. This is a ministerial decision with DEFRA and with the UK government. So what the committee is being asked is to give an opinion um, for the minister to consider, but our opinion, whether considered, um, makes no effect. So therefore, you know, we can play politics as you're calling it, right, William, but you know, we're not, we're stating a position. Our role is to scrutinize and to help where possible. Um, and we have not been given that time. And therefore I think that that is imperative that that is put on record. You can agree with it or you can disagree with it, but we have not had time. We have not had sight and we have not fully been able to consider the impacts. And I think that is just basic and clear. Controversial, Mr. Chairman, in this. I mean, this is fairly straightforward. It's technical. So, I mean, if we can't accept this, I don't know what we're doing. And this committee, if we, if we, if we, if we can't make a decision on what we've been told today in relation to something as simple and straightforward, I can understand if there was SI, SIs coming to this committee that were controversial and were, were, were an issue. I have no issue with that. But this is quite simple and straightforward. Anybody else have any more views on this? Well, Okay. Stella, will we take a. I clearly haven't got a, uh, an anonymous view on this here. So. No, there's not an anonymous view on this. No. Okay. So, Philip, we are proposing that we have had insufficient time uh, or information to scrutinise and reach a completely discussed out informed view on this one here. And William has a, a different view that we should uh, 
I let it go through and support it. So just to take a vote on, is that right, Stella? Okay, yep. so uh, those in support of the, the proposal suggested by Philip, please. I'd say what? Um, yeah, Chair, um, there's two things. First of all, we're not nitpicking. Um, we're doing what should be our proper job. And we're not having either A, adequate time, and B, adequate information to do that job, right? That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, all we can do is offer an opinion, right? It, it, as, as it has already been outlined very clearly by Claire there, and indeed by, by the officials that, that we were listening to there, um, it's for the minister to make uh, his views known to DEFRA. Right, so this isn't a question of blocking or holding up anything. It's about due process being followed to the way it should be followed, irrespective, and uh, I'm glad William's across all the detail of this. Uh, so um, I propose that in light of, and I did uh, send in a form of wording last year, which was caveating what we were doing, Essentially, the process we are going through is really noting what's coming before us today. Yeah. I feel like very bad. So the committee proposal from Patsy is the committee notes. Well, and, Patsy, there be note. And note use it. the form of wording that has already been agreed, already been. I think we should. Uh, let the general and wider community see what may the committee feels on this. I think that's a, a soft one. The member to try and get this over the line the way he wants it over the line. I think we, we put it over. Sorry, but what do you want it over the line, William? With proper scrutiny, um, with enough detail to us. Um, we've, we've seen all this with RHI before, whenever adequate detail was, was, wasn't before committee. We're not um, we're not here about RHI. You're always waiting back to that. But I mean, Patsy, no, no, you're, you're no, playing no, politics, no, Patsy. No, you're playing no, politics, no, Patsy. No, 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 know what you're doing. Not stupid. Okay, I don't have to we'll take, we'll take a few minutes to close session to discuss this in more detail, right? Mm. Okay. Committee room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This okay. Okay. Um, right, we're going to close session and could I ask any witnesses of joined the meeting by Starleaf to please now leave the meeting. I can ask the uh, communication to now add all members into a spotlight and uh, turn off the red broadcasting button. Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. You don't need to worry about the rest of the page, just okay. read that caveat. Okay, so in relation to the, um, the, this particular um, SA, um, the, uh, the committee wishes it to be clearly understood that due to the lack of information on the um, AG, AGS05 uh, and the limited time it has considered it, it has been unable to fully explore and understand the potential impacts and implications to this jurisdiction. This difficulty has been further confirmed by the fact that it is being asked to do so in the context of legal uncertainties around the UK internal market bill and the thought agreement, and the committee has agreed to note this SA. Okay? Okay, so we're going to move on to item 7, Department Briefing on the Fisheries Trade Negotiations. That's at page 64 to 71. And I want to welcome by, uh, in by Starleaf, Claire Vincent, the Acting Director of Marine and Fisheries, Kieran Cunningham, Acting Head of Marine and Fisheries Transition Team, Paddy Campbell, head of, Acting Head of Sea Fisheries Policy and Grants, and I'd like to invite the officials to begin their presentation. See Paddy on the screen here. Can you see uh, me, Mr. Chairman, Claire Vincent? I can't see Claire. Are you Claire? I can see Paddy. Can see but you can name. hear me. I can hear you. I can see your name on the screen, but I just can't see. Um. Okay. Oh, oh there we go. That got me now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much for that um, introduction, uh, Chairman. We've got a number of things we'd like to bring to you this morning. Um, uh, Paddy, is, uh, some, some folk will be familiar to you. Uh, we want to open up the, dis um, the discussions with giving you an update on the fisheries negotiations. And then, uh, so that's with Paddy, who's uh, familiar to all of you. And then we're going to move on to the Ireland, Northern Ireland uh, Protocol and the implications of that on our uh, fishing fleet and to bring you up to speed with, with where the discussions are on that. Uh, and that'll be uh, Kieran Cunningham will be joining us for that, uh, for that part. And then um, the rest of the time, we want to bring you up to date on all the... Um, the legislation, the, the, the SIs, uh, and that will be with uh, David Steele and uh, Patrick Smith, both of whom you've seen before. Um, so I'm hoping actually that everybody is um, on, on the line here uh, because, say, just to, uh, yep, 
everybody's there. That's great. Um, just to make sure that we can answer um, what, whatever questions you, you might have. Um, you, we mentioned last week that you had a number of questions which kind of linked into what we wanted to talk to you about today. So we, we promised that we would uh, bring you up to speed um, with um, some of those things. You, you, there was also in our discussions on the fisheries bill, um, you, some of you mentioned there was a, a lack of detail. And of course, some of that is that we, we explained that that's because that's a it's, a it's a framework bill. And some of the details that you, you want explained, you'll maybe find in the, in the part on CFP P12, which is where we uh, write over, uh, so that um, we write over some of the details that are, are currently in the Common Fisheries Policy uh, to, to make that operable in our in our own legis legislature. Um, so we'll we'll be looking at some of that. Uh, later. Uh, again, as I said last week, um, the timescales have been extremely challenging and I know um, you're all uh, very concerned uh, about that and just about the, 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 the nature. So you'll, you'll see that it has been possible to give you a kind of a full uh, written brief on CFP 12. Um, but on the other ones that are on your list today, um, it's just really a few lines to let you know where we're at and we'll, we'll go into why that is um, later on. So as I say, it's fast moving and a lot of that's outside our control, but we, we'll do our best to answer your, your questions this morning. And um, if you're content with that chair, I will hand over to Paddy to start. Um, giving you a bit of an update on the fisheries negotiations, a wee bit about the process there and how those are going so far. Okay. Thank you, Pally. Come on there. Hello, Pally. Paddy, can you unmute? Paddy, can, can you unmute or can you hear us? Paddy, we can't hear you. Claire, Claire can you pick up there, Claire? Yep, yeah, okay. So, um, this, Paddy, if you, can, if you can get in, you just, just shout over me here, because... Um, Okay, so the uh, the you you have your your briefing packs there, and the we want to talk to you a bit about the the future fisheries agreements and the negotiations. And um, as you'll be aware, um, previously we have done uh, most of those uh, um, agreements from within the EU, and have attended um, December um, Fisheries Council. Um, as we, uh, and that's where the EU then um, allocates um, access and quota shares. But this year we will be uh, negotiating as a, a separate a coastal state, um, and it'll be um, out with that internal um, EU process. And that's how. But we will be uh, negotiating then with the EU, and again, the, the goal all round is about sustainable, um, sustainably uh, fish, fish share of fish stocks. Um, so the the agreement that we need to enter into with EU um, looks then at uh, data sharing, how we because clearly um, fish swim. Um, and uh, we, we need to still share the, the data and monitoring um, and control and enforcement. We need to have an understanding with the EU as, as to how that will be done in the future. Um, so um, the, the uh, but at the minute, negotiations are really difficult. Um, there's a further update the, the, this afternoon. Uh, I should explain that the, the, those, the, those um, Discussions are primarily, uh, so uh, DEFRA leads on behalf of the UK uh, in those uh, discussions with EU, um, but 
uh, the, the DEFRA team is, is very good about talking to the devolved um, administrations um, and, and talking through what the various issues are with us and, get, and collecting our views. So although the actual um, negotiations are reserved, they are, uh, there's, there's very good relations, as there has always had to be because we're share, it's a shared um, resource. Um, so we've always had very, very good links uh, in fisheries management uh, right across the UK. Um, UK and uh, EU at the minute, the negotiations aren't going, aren't going particularly well um, in that um, EU want guarantees on the issue of um, access uh, and uh, quota shares. And of course, UK um, wants to uh, re re rebalance those quota shares, wants to, um, has different ideas about how, how we do the, the, the quota shares. Um, which are not popular then with the EU. Um, and our, our, our starting point in negotiations has been that there's no automatic access to UK waters and that access is then negotiated on an annual basis um, uh, uh, as part of the uh, annual fisheries negotiations. Previously, the December Council negotiations, but now we would be doing that as a coastal state and that those are done annually. Um, but there, over the last few weeks, uh, we understand that things um, are, are perhaps uh, improving uh, a, a little bit. Um, so um, that's uh, probably just, I don't know whether it was, see Patty is maybe gone out and trying to come back in again. Just take questions because we're way before but, time. Has anybody got, at least tried to send me a wee message here as well, see, were we? Okay. So, Paddy is saying he's unmu un unmuted, he's sitting, he's unmuted and can hear, um, and he thinks something needs to be done at, at, at your end, so I don't know whether that's possible or not, but we will certainly try to take um, any questions around that. Patty is our lead on, on this area, um, but uh, we could certainly try and uh, take any questions you might have on that. Yeah, OK. Um, well, with Ro Rosemary, yeah. can I ask a question? Thank you very much. Um, you talked about the negotiations that were taking place and DEFRA consulted you. Would it not be more practical, really, to have someone from Northern Ireland, someone from the executive over with DEFRA consulting now on these, uh, within these negotiations? Um, Rosemary, uh, my understanding is that, uh, that international negotiations are a reserved matter. <clears throat> and as I say, I can't emphasize enough that the, the DEFRA team is very good. There are very good uh, links with them. We share, obviously we're required to share all our fisheries uh, data and information. Um, and the, so the, the start point actually for the whole of the UK is that every part of the UK must benefit um, from uh, must benefit from whatever the agreements are going forward. Um, and I, I'm, I, I certainly am very content that they uh, put our position. They're very much aware of our priorities. Um, and that um, they, uh, they, they put our priorities um, in, in the forefront uh, for each of the devolved uh, nations. We all have slightly different fishing patterns um, and fishing practices over the years. So um, it, it, it's, not, it's not very contentious. They, they know what our priorities are um, and that doesn't, um, Con uh, that's not in uh, contention with other parts of the UK. Um, so, uh, and, and I think the, the, the minister has also met then with uh, Minister Prentice, and there's been uh, a bit of discussion backwards and forwards as well. And I think they're uh, largely content um, with how those negotiations go. So it's, it's a function of the fact that uh, international negotiations are actually um, are, are a reserved matter rather than fully devolved. Um, Claire, there's a couple of things here on the on the note we have here. Um, and point six it says that if, if no agreement is reached, the default position according to the UK is no access for either parties to each other's waters. Um, so 
See, in the situation of no deal, would we end up in a situation where boats from the north of Ireland would be barred from the waters of the south and vice versa? Does any impact on what impact that, any assessment of what impact that might have on the industry? Right. There's certainly an assessment of impact on the industry because um, certainly our own fleet um, do quite a lot of fishing in Irish uh, stroke EU waters. Um, so it certainly would impact on our fleet. Um, so that, uh, that, is, uh, that, that is an issue. Um, we, and we want to be able to come to a point where there is reciprocal um, access agreed. Um, but it, it's just at, at, at this point in the, go, uh, the there's the kind of uh, drawn hard lines. Uh, and as I say, this is what the negotiations are about, is about can there be a, a softening? Um, and could we agree? Um, so the, the, the start point, as you rightly say, is that um, no, no, no access uh, at, at the start, and, and we're look, that's what the negotiations are doing, is um, they're looking as to whether there can be any um, flex in that at all. <coughs> but I think UK sees the uh, uh, you know, advantage of being able to do something uh, more flexible, and particularly we, we are emphasising that, that for our own fleet, um, we would like to be able to have reciprocal um, access arrangements um, with 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 uh, Republic of Ireland EU. Tell me, Claire, um, in what situation? I, there? I can hear you. Yes. Sorry. Is that Paddy? Yes. I'm on the phone. <laughs> yeah. Paddy, can you hear us? Yes, I've managed to get through on the phone, Chair. Yeah. Uh, uh, P P Paddy, Claire just answered a question that I that I asked there about the prospect of a no deal and not not being able to access the northern boats not be able to access the waters in the south and vice versa and the impact of that. And then the second question I would ask was, and and, that, and if that situation emerged and a hard Brexit situation, w w would the Vossenage Agreement where, where would it sit in terms of if there was a hard Brexit? Would, would it would still would it still exist or could it be revoked? Okay. What situation there? On the, on, the, on the first point, um, if there's no fisheries agreement, um, the arrangements for access and quota shares would have to be done, would have to fall to the coastal state negotiations solely. Uh, so there might still be, um, might still be agreement on that um, done there. Um, if, there's, if there's no agreement whatsoever, um, there would be a problem with regard to access. Now, if wasn't I, from our point of view, and the fisheries bill provides that we can still allow access to third country vessels by a way of license. Um, on the Irish and uh, European side, um, they have a, a separate regulation that deals with with that, which requires um, which does require an agreement to be in place. Now, there may be a gap of a period while uh, an equivalent to the to the Wazenag is put in place. It may need a, a, a more formal treaty than the current exchange of letters that exists. Um, but that will be for, the, for um, the Commission to allow and for talks to begin between UK government and the Commission uh, and ourselves on, on a more formal arrangement to allow Wazenag to continue. Uh, thank you. Um, Philip? Uh, Chair, my, my, my question was in relation to the impact of no agreement, and, and so you more or less uh, asked it for me, but I mean, I'm a wee bit confused because everybody has a different opinion of what actually happens if there's no agreement. I mean, I, I note in the debate in the British House of Lords in Westminster, there seems to be some, some indication that if there's no agreement, that uh, the kind of rights will be underpinned by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which I hadn't heard about prior to, to this week. Uh, I mean, there, there's other uh, opinions that the current arrangement will continue, and then there's the, the opinion that there's no access. So, I mean, I'm just a wee bit confused of, you know, hopefully there, there, there is a uh, isn't a situation arises where there's no agreement, but I mean, I'm, I'm just a wee bit confused about a what actually happens, who oversees it, and the impact of, of no agreement. Okay. Well, at the end of the day, um, the, 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 the,
you know, the two sides have to agree whether they're going to allow each other's vessels and each other's waters to get to to take uh, fishing opportunities. So, um, in the absence of, a, of a, an agreement of the future fisheries agreement, the, the framework agreement, and it falls then to the coastal state negotiations. So you might get access in the North Sea for some stocks, but they might not agree something in the west of Scotland. Um, it becomes more more bitty and less predictable. Okay. Thanks for that, Paddy. John? Th thank you, Chair. Um, I, I too was going to ask about the, the, the potential of no deal, and that's been covered already. So I, I will... Uh, Go into detail on something else, which is that you know th these reports are are full of complexities, <laughs> as is the the general issue. And the, the two things, apart from the the, the uh, prospect of no deal uh, that, that come off the report today for me, are first of all the lack of agreement um, with uh, an assumed deadline of around the end of November for for agreement to be reached, and, and that's quite quite a frightening prospect in itself. But also there seems to be much remaining uncertainty about the designation of Northern Ireland lands and fish and whether or not these will be subject to tariffs in the event of no deal. Um, so can I ask then in relation to that, what is the ministerial involvement in conversations with DEFRA and others as far as the, the officials are concerned um, and what impact does that have currently on the negotiations taking place? Are we potentially at, at, at a point where there needs to be more direct ministerial involvement if it doesn't already exist? So I mentioned, um, John, that the minister has met on a couple of occasions now with uh, Minister Prentice, uh, and he's certainly strongly expressed his views uh, around some of the issues you've mentioned, which, uh, again, once we get on to the, the, the tariff issues and everything like that, I, I'll move on to, to ask Kieran to give you a bit of background to that. But um, the, the Minister is obviously um, uh, making it very clear that he wants uh, no additional burdens um, on the Northern Ireland fishing fleet. Um, and he, you know, he, his policy position on that is very clear and he is articulating that to Minister Prentice. There's been a number of calls um, over the last few weeks, one, one last week actually. But uh, if, you, if you would like to move on, if you'd be happy to move on to, um, to uh, Kieran, uh, once, once we're talking about um, tariffs and the like, that's all issues to do with the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol um, issues. So if, if you would like a chair, we can move uh, into that area. And I'm hoping that Kieran's uh, technology works. <laughs> um, but uh, leave that up to you, Chair, if you want to move on to that or if, if you still have further questions on the uh, fisheries negotiations. Um. Are we okay to move on to the tariff? Are we okay? Or, or John, are you, John, are you okay with the answer? I'm happy enough to. Oh, sorry, okay, sorry. We've got a couple of speakers down here. Harry, you want to ask? Okay, ask thank you, Chair. And thank you, Claire, and appreciate all the work you're doing. Claire, come December, it'll be big changes for you this year, obviously, being heavily involved in the Fish Council in the EU. Going forward, um, do you think there will be a future UK or even British Isles Fish Council? Maybe? Thank you. So, Harry, um, we, of course, we, uh, as as an external, as a as a as a coastal state, our negotiations will be done separately from the EU. So, for the first time this December, we would not be taking part in the EU December Council because that's. That's uh, that's agreement between the club that is the EU, and actually, what happens with the other coastal states is that they come to their agreements um, before uh, before the EU um, have their December Fisheries Council. So the discussions will be brought forward to um, uh, no November. The, the way that uh, Norway and the Faroe Isles is that they have their discussions before EU Fisheries Council, so that's all settled beforehand. Um, in terms of 
So and, and our, uh, our separate negotiations, so we're at the minute talking to, or UK at the minute is talking to EU, I explained that those discussions aren't going great, but our discussions with the other um, independent coastal states like Nor Norway and the Faroes are actually going quite well. So we are able to uh, come to agreements with them. Um, you asked specifically then, so I think that is, so you asked then, will there be a, a, a UK or, I mean, it wouldn't be a, a British Isles um, forum because clearly Ireland is still within the EU um, process. Um, so I hope I've explained that uh, the, the coastal state process takes, takes forward or, or progresses those issues actually before the EU process. Um, Paddy, do you have anything yep. uh, more you want to add there? Yes, just yeah, yeah. The, the coastal state negotiations. So, whereas we used to go in December and argue over um, quota shares with the rest of the member states, we won't be doing that this year. We'll be having the coastal state negotiations to conclude uh, in November time. So, the EU at that stage will know how much of the various fish stocks it has to distribute amongst the member states. Um, I think then your last part was to do with internal allocations. So the bulk of fishing opportunities will continue to be just allocated between the fisheries administrations in the way they are now. Um, the government white paper um, for the fisheries bill what, two or three years ago uh, made a statement about additional quota. And the additional quota in, in simple terms is... Uh, extra quota that we might get through fisheries negotiations um, with the EU that we wouldn't normally have had access to. The White Paper said that uh, they would be looking at maybe distributing uh, that additional quota in, by some other means. Now, as far as Northern Ireland is concerned, our position on that is that um, our fleet is the most active fleet in the RSC, um, and our fleet is developed um, it depends on mainly RSC opportunities. So, as, as far as the additional quota is concerned, we would we would still have we're still having that discussion with the other devolved administrations. It won't happen annually. What we will do is we will agree that um, as part of the um, this framework agreement that we will have between us, um, which uh, will be discussed with the committee at some stage in the future, probably before the end of the year. You'll get sight of. Um, the framework agreement, and that will you know, discuss the arrangements about how we are going to um, uh, deal with the, the additional quota between the, the four administrations. Hope that answers your question. Very good. Thank you, Pauline. Okay. Thank you again, Claire. Thanks, Chair. Um, Claire, Claire Billy. Thank you. Um, just Again, obviously, then the, the, there's huge policy issues going on here as well, um, and we know that fisheries is the is a big contentious issue within these negotiations. Um, but we also know that within the proposals going forward, well, this says I we're looking at big policy changes in here as well, and the House of Lords have tried to put amendments through with the the fisheries bill um, to include. Um, monitoring and sustainability elements within there that were removed then in the House of Commons when it went back. So can you give us a bit of an update in terms of um, where we are with the UK's position, the UK government position on that? So um, if we're looking at total allowable catch, for example, you know, how are we going to be monitoring that, the sustainability of it? Um, what's the monitoring procedures and proposals contained um, for the UK to move forward on all of this? Okay, Claire, so you're referring to the CFP 12? The, yeah, okay. So again, that is that is around the operability of a lot of the details. You, you We mentioned uh, folk mentioned last week and in the assembly debate about you know the fisheries bill not having the detail. Uh, we explained again that that's a fr it's a framework bill and that a lot of the details of how this is done um, will actually be uh, written over from common fisheries policy through this um, SICFP um, twelve. So you've asked about uh, and I I will maybe um, hand over to. Um, 
uh, David or Patrick to to say um, a little bit about that. But actually, this is um, that this is for us. This is really business as usual. This is getting the legislation in place to do business as usual uh, in terms of our. Uh, catch and, and quota regulations are agreements on data collection that we will continue to collect the data that's necessary to manage the fish stocks of the whole of the whole area um, and that we will we're bringing across all the existing arrangements on discard plans so it's it, for us it's actually there's a lot in there, there's a lot of detail but it's actually business as usual and I think um, it would be or it is considered like a, 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 a category Category one SI. So um, that, that it, it, so, but I'll I'll hand over to David in the first instance. Claire, Claire, Patty, can I just come in? Oh, sorry, sorry. Patty. Yeah, sorry. Um, yes, uh, on the, on the, the fisheries bill, one of the important things in the fisheries bill is it it uh, requires us to produce these joint fisheries statements and say what we're going to what management what fisheries management plans we're going to introduce and. Um, a lot of the details. So whilst we're rolling over um, the bulk of the EU regulations um, to to these SIs, um, over the next eighteen months to two years, we'll be we'll be developing new policies. So we might, for example, have a, a, a management plan, say for the REC, and that management plan would include some of the detail that you're looking for as far as sustainability. And maybe the you know the, the use that we might make of things like remote electronic monitoring. I think the the issue that the government had with the with the House of Lords amendments was that this was stating something hard and fast in the Fisheries Bill that everybody had to sign up to and didn't really take account of the the differences in the different fleets and the different areas, which are more for the devolved administrations to develop amongst each other and decide you know whether. REM is appropriate, or whether um, you know the vessel. I mean, we still have you know, most of our fleet. Um, Thirty percent of our fleet is subject to uh, vessel monitoring systems and electronic catch recording. And it's, uh, whether we extend, you know, some of those measures to the smaller vessels, which currently don't have that. Um, whether the larger vessels are required to adopt you know, things like the remote electronic monitoring. So those those are things that we will we will be looking at over the next. Two years, and you'll see them and referenced in the joint fisheries statements and a management plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and can I thank you once again for uh, coming to the committee for, for the presentation. Um, in relation to, to the negotiations between the UK and the EU, suppose to those negotiations are complete, we won't fully know exactly how. The local fleet stand will still, for instance, will there still be quotas after we leave Europe on the first of January? Is there any? Are we any? Are we any clearer on those issues? Ali, do you want to yep. take that one? Yes, I mean there will still be quotas. I mean everybody in the coastal states is, are signed up to the principles of fixing at a maximum sustainable yield levels. Uh, we have the scientific advice. Um, the, one of the fallbacks in coastal states is if you don't agree, a, um, if you don't agree a attack, um, the, the talks continue. It doesn't just stop. Um, but there's a duty of both sides to not to overfix the stocks. There will still be quotas, so the reason may be the UK and Secretary of State will determine, I suppose, on behalf of of the administrations, what how much a particular stock he deems it safe for us to take, given all the uncertainties, if there are any uncertainties. So there will be there will be a determination. The fishermen will know um, at the start of the year how much they can fish. Okay. Okay. Thank you, William. Um, Morris or Patsy, were any of you indicating uh, that you any chance that you want to come in? No, because the screaming off now. Okay, okay. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the officials for attending uh, and giving us a very detailed presentation, and for taking all of the questions and providing um, very detailed answers. So, item eight on the agenda: oral evidence on the fisheries EU exit NA regulations. 
One of the advisory members of the department hasn't, has, yet, uh, has not supplied any papers for this agenda item, but indicated which of the officials will be present at the time for the committee meeting, um, the, for the committee meeting pack issuing. However, at page 88 of the pack, there is a line that appears to indicate that it has been decided that the provisions of this SR will now be included in the SICFP 20 and AH 22 and we will be taking evidence on these SIs in the next agenda item and I suggest we keep any questions until that point. Um, item 9, Departmental Order and Briefing, uh, DEFRA CFP 20, Marine and Fisheries NI Protocol Implementation Regulations 2020. Uh, can I advise members that the Department uh, has not supplied papers for this item or indicated which officials will be present in time for the committee meeting uh, pack issuing? And again, on page 88 of the pack, there's a statement that indicates that while um, DERA has received a draft SA from DEFRA, they're still working through the, the details with its legal advisor. The indicative laying will be the 20th of October, therefore the committee should be taking evidence uh, before that date. Officials will be giving evidence to a short day, and I can suggest we hold our questions until that point. Uh, item 10, Departmental Oral Evidence, DSA DEFRA, CFP 12, CFP EU Exit Regulation 2020. I want to refer members to the papers at 75 to 88 and the, the memo from the clerk at 15 to 20 of the tabled papers. And the clerk has already briefed the committee on this SA. And I'd like to take this opportunity now to welcome on to Starleaf. Uh, David Steele, Grade 7 Marine and Fisheries Policy Division, and Patrick Smith, um, Marine and Fisheries Policy, uh, Policy uh, Division. Um, Patrick? Good morning, Chair and members. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, just check. Yeah. Can, great. That's great. Can I uh, check that, that I can be heard okay just before I do, say something later on that maybe no, that's okay, yeah? Perfect. Can the members hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Very good. Yes, Chair, if I may, I'll, uh, I'll make some short introductory remarks on the fisheries uh, EU exit in Northern Ireland regulations 2020, and uh, we'll take, take it from there. Um, this regulation had been included uh, as a marker in the ERA Committee's work programme uh, for consideration of uh, an SL1 in October um, to include amendments to the following EU exit SIs in order to align with the uh, protocol. Uh, those EU exit SIs were the Fisheries Amendment, Northern Ireland EU Exit Regulations 2019, and the Aquatic and Animal Health and Alien Species in Aquaculture Amendment, Northern Ireland EU Exit Regulations. Um, as, the, uh, as you've already noted there, Chair, um, part two of the written briefing uh, that was provided um, on the proposed amendments um, showed that uh, we were uh, initially going to bring this forward uh, in an SL1, uh, but more recently um, it has been decided that it uh, would be taken forward instead in CFP20, um, the Marine and Fisheries Northern Ireland Protocol Implementation Regulations 2020, which uh, we'll come on to in more detail later, and in AH22, uh, which is the Agriculture, Animals and Aquaculture Health Identification, Welfare, Trade, etc. Amendment, EU Exit Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. They, they certainly don't make those titles short and snappy. Um, uh, we'll, of course, inform the committee of uh, further progress on uh, CFP 20 and on uh, AH 22 uh, when we're in a position to do so. Um, at, the, at the present time, Chair, uh, there's uh, nothing further that uh, can be added um, on on those regulations. Thank you. Okay. Any members want to um, any questions in relation to this one? Okay. Um, can I ask about CFP 12? I don't think he's covered CFP 12. CFP 12. You want, you want to move on to CFP 12 next? Okay. Yeah. Is okay? Yeah. Okay. I just. Uh, in terms of CFP 12, then, Chair, the, the committee will have noted from the, the, the written briefing provided um, that uh, this SI is the most advanced in terms of its uh, development and is the one which, on which the department is able to present uh, the committee with the, the most information. Um, CFP 12 relates to the Common Fisheries Policy Amendment, etc., EU Exit Regulations 2020, and is needed to ensure that there is continuity in the regulation of UK waters at the end of the transition period. Um, so in terms of the 
um, territorial extent of this particular ASI. Uh, it is the, the UK. Um, the committee will have noticed that the indicative laying date for this ASI in Parliament is the 13th of October 2020. Um, it is a technical um, uh, ASI. Uh, there are no uh, policy changes involved uh, with those regulations. They are simply there to um, provide operability fixes uh, where provisions would uh, either be no longer would no, would no longer operate effectively or make sense come the end of the uh, transition period. Um, the, the they'll amend aspects of retained EU law on demersal discard plans, 2020 total allowable catch and quota regulation, and on the EU's data collection uh, multi-annual program. Uh, Chair, with your agreement, I, I won't go into the detail um, of each of those uh, at, at this point. Um, there's a, a, a summary uh, of what is proposed on each of them uh, in, the, in, the, in, the written, in the written briefing uh, provided. Uh, CFP 12 will also uh, revoke uh, a number of pieces of EU legislation uh, from retained EU law and amend uh, a number of EU exit SIs. Um, again, Chair, uh, these are listed in the written briefing um, for members' uh, uh, information at part one in paragraphs three, four, uh, and five. Uh, in addition, CFP 12 will make amendments in consequence of the EU withdrawal agreement uh, to revoke previous deficiency corrections to retained EU law, uh, as that re retained EU law will no longer be created um, by operation of the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. Um, Chair, I know there's been some ongoing discussion this week, and uh, and and, and uh, th there has been some uh, earlier um, in proceedings uh, for this for for this uh, CFP. Um, we had uh, asked uh, for the committee to uh, ind indicate uh, its position uh, on whether the provisions should extend uh, to uh, to the to the UK, um, but uh, obviously uh, we're in the committee's hands uh, in terms of how it wants to uh, approach that particular matter. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Patsy. Hatsi Malone, can you hear me? There, I'm online now, I think. Good morning, Patsy. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Um, if I could ask David there, um, the use of that phrase, revoke deficiency corrections, what exactly does that mean? Uh, they, they, they were operational, or uh, operability uh, corrections. Um, that were applied or uh, were applied um, the the first time around. Um, so those those have sort of those have been overturned because uh, we've we, we're we we're, we're now operating under the European Withdrawal Act 2018. Sure, no, sir. If, if you I don't, but forgive my forgive me if I labour on this, but if you correct the deficiency, why would you vote, revoke the correction of a deficiency? If, if I can add, it's Patrick here, Chair, if I can come in there, just uh, I think um, there's quite a lot of amendments in that regard um, to remove references to the EMF regulation, which is EU number 508 uh, 1214, which was um, referenced in a whole lot of amendments to the EU exit SI programs previously. And uh, as a consequence of uh, Article 138 of the withdrawal agreement, um, the UK will be relying on the EU version of the EMF regulation. So there's a whole host of um, amendments therein to correct those deficiencies. Um, I would I would safely count maybe 50 lines saying, you know, we're um, removing the reference to the previous EMF regulation because we're now relying on uh, the article in the EU withdrawal agreement. No, sorry, I'm not getting into the specifics of it. Uh, I was only saying to the, it's the wording of it. If you're a deficiency correction, right? Why would you revoke a deficiency correction if if a, if, yeah. if a deficiency has already been corrected? Yeah, the deficiency correction was incorrect. Okay, okay. <laughs> 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 right, okay. Have you now? Right, thanks very much for that. Okay. Okay. Um, 
There's no other Sorry. members. Uh, Fry Philip. I just mean there's no reference to the Rural Needs Act. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, has DARE done any work in terms of trying to? Uh, questions on page 18 of your. Uh, you know, satisfy itself that there's no issues there. Um, yes, I appreciate uh, that uh, there, there, there's no uh, uh, reference um, to, to, to rural needs. Uh, I think, as colleagues have maybe said previously in the uh, in the earlier earlier ASI, um, then it's uh, because this uh, UK. Uh, government, uh, UK-wide, ASI being taken through Parliament, um, then uh, it's, it, it, it wasn't uh, necessary. Uh, however, we, we, we do um, take um, cognizance of both the, the quality and uh, the rural needs uh, assessments in, in each of these uh, ASIs, and uh, it's for uh, business areas to determine uh, the, the extent. Uh, uh, by which it does that. I think we, because this particular um, ASI is making um, uh, upper, upper, operability fixes um, to, to, the, to the legislation and there are no policy changes uh, involved uh, in it, um, that uh, we, we decided that there, was, uh, there were no implications uh, for, for, for rural needs. Um, but uh, I accept that there, there's no reference uh, uh, Directly in the um, written briefing uh, provided, Chair, uh, and uh, we'll ensure that that's uh, rectified for uh, for any further um, SIs that uh, are brought to the committee's attention. Okay. Um, I see there also that there is I can't see much or any information on consultation. I'm wondering if there are any plans for consultation for uh, stakeholders that could be impacted by this. And also, um, again, and I've asked the question before, is Dara, is Dara reassured that, um, that there will be no major changes for people who may be impacted by this SI? Uh, on, the, on, the, on the first uh, point, Chair, um, uh, earlier in the process, um, uh, we had explained uh, to Dara's uh, Brexit uh, fishery stakeholder um, group the, the purpose of uh, this uh, uh, particular SI uh, and the fact that it's to make um, technical amendments to to retain the EU regs to make to make them operable. Um, so that's that's the engagement that had uh, taken taken place at that point. Uh, on your on your second uh, and second point about uh, being being re reassured, uh, yes, we're 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 content uh, that uh, this particular SI um, uh, reflects uh, the the need the requirement um, to to make. Uh, Operability uh, fixes only. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you, David. Um, what about impacts such as operational practices or financial implications, David? Well, again, uh, again to the Chair, um, because, because this is uh, uh, purely a, a technical um, uh, ASI, um, it, it, it shouldn't have. Uh, any any implications? Any 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 financial impl implications per se? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, Morris, I'm going to call you in there. See your hand up. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Chair. Uh, Chair, it's a, it's, a, it's, a matter, it's a matter of of, of what I've read, uh, and, and my understanding of it is that the uh, UK government have offered a three-year phasing out. Uh, to the EU, I was wondering how would that impact upon the, the Northern Ireland Ireland Protocol, or uh, for that matter, the impact of this internal market bill. I wonder is is, pa is Paddy still on the line? Maybe to answer the first part of that question. No, no, he's. He He's, he's not. In, in, ter in terms of uh, the, the, the impact on the uh, of the of the protocol, of the protocol um, again, because you know this is related to um, te technical changes, um, there the, the really shouldn't uh, be impact any impact of the protocol on this uh, particular mm -hmm. um, SI. I see Paddy's trying to maybe trying to rejoin. Can you hear us, Paddy? No, he can't. 
Um, uh, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not in a position, uh, Chair, to, to answer the first part of that in terms of the, the, th the three years phasing, phasing out. Mm -hmm. what, what about the internal market bill? Will that have an impact? The internal market bill, we will uh, we will have to await the I think the final the final version of that uh, bill uh, and and see uh, what its provisions are uh, when it uh, pa pass it passes uh, through uh, through 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 Westminster. Um, mm -hmm. So at the, at the present time, you know, we we can't really provide any, any great uh, analysis of the the implications for uh, the, of of the internal market bill. Okay. I think that will, that will, I'll just have to wait, uh, and, we, uh, and we'll take that forward uh, once we're clearer um, uh, about uh, its, its provisions. Okay, thanks very much. Please, Chair. Head on. Um, Rosemary. Yeah, thank you. Um, you spoke earlier on that the SI was recategorised from a 3 to a 1. Can you give me some uh, explanation as to why this happened? Yes, certainly. Uh, it's, it's obviously been a... a a developing process, if I can put it put it that way, and uh, initially, um, Defra had considered that all fisheries uh, legislation, um, because of its nature, uh, it, it could be um, con considered con controversial. Um, so uh, we we categorised it at that time, uh, Rosemary, as a as a as a category three. Uh, on that on that basis, uh, but obviously, as we 've uh, re received more information uh, on cfp twelve and uh, and came to appreciate it that it, it involved uh, operability fixes, uh, then there was an opportunity um, to to re recategorize it uh, uh, as a as a category one okay. thank you. John? Me. Th thank you, Chair. Um, I was actually going to, to ask a question there about that categorisation, uh, Paddy, but for, for clarification, for, and I understand that the change here would have been in relation to it be, being a, a purely technical fix, as you call it, um, but in relation to that, would it be possible in the future where, where categorisation of the, these SIs have changed, that there might be a sub-note put on it to let us know that they've changed um, or be reconsidered uh, and the, the, the rationale behind that? In addition to that, would it be possible also to have some written report on the application of the Rural Needs Act, as mentioned earlier by Philip, on um, these ESIs and other legislative processes as they come forward? When we consider that, the, the by and large, and, and of course with some exceptions, the matters that we're considering are likely to have uh, a greater impact on our rural communities than elsewhere. It might be useful to, to reflect um, as a matter of course, what, what um, notice taken of the Rural Needs Act with regard to the, to the processes coming forward, if that's possible? Um, through, through the Chair, uh, certainly uh, in, in terms of uh, your fir first point and uh, uh, the request for um, some indication of the, the rationale behind uh, the categorisation, um, I think the, 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 issue, the issue there, John, was that um, the system was catching up, basically. Um, we, were, we had, uh, say, categorised it uh, initially as a, as a category three uh, and that you know was in the system uh, and obviously then um, as, as we as we received more information um, then uh, it was it was re recategorized um, uh, but but uh, but I but I accept uh, accept your point and, and we'll ensure that um, there is uh, some rationale um, for the categorization and uh, uh, and especially should there be any any change to the categorization uh, on your second point then in terms of the the, the application of uh, uh, the rural needs act I, again um, I accept the, the, the point made and uh, we'll ensure that uh, that is uh, that information is provided uh, for subsequent SIs or, or even chair chair in general how how it's being applied to SIs in general. I don't want to, to increase the resource that, that you require to do these matters or increase the workload, but, but if we could have an oversight of the, the, how, how the Rural Needs Act applied in general to these, I, I would be content with that. Okay, we'll, we'll do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, well, what the... Oh, sorry, Claire. 
Is it a little bit there? Chair, uh, and thanks for the briefing there as well. Um, I just want to really check. I mean, we've been told that this we haven't seen the SI obviously, but it, it, it's only operate operability fixes. Um, can you give us reassurances that there are no big policy shifts, or even the operability fixes contained within this SI do not potentially lead to policy changes? Um. Oh, go on ahead, Patrick. Sorry. Yeah, maybe just on, on the on the latter point there, just in terms of the operability fixes, just to give you a, a you know a flavour of, of what what they are. I have a few examples here. Just to, um, so so right across the the EU regulations which are amended, um, you know there, there's many many references to um, to union waters. So the operability fixes are changing those to read UK waters. In other circumstances, it refers to the member states shall en shall make regulations. You know, we're saying that now, or the UK SI is saying, you know, a fisheries administration, of which DERA is one, shall make regulations. Other things like, you know, where there's references to euros, you know, for, for monetary values, that's changing that to pounds sterling. And, and some other cases where it was previously exit day, we're changing that, uh, rolling it over to, to read implementation day. You know, things like that. So, I mean, it goes back to David's first point and his opening remarks talked about you know, all of these amendments in CFP 12 are to ensure uh, continuity of regulations in UK waters. And that just gives you a flavour of, of some of the things that are coming through. And that's essentially, you know, the, the, in the main, what, what's provided for in CFP 12. So we were hearing in the previous briefing there that negotiations aren't going very well. Um, and we passed the LCM for the fisheries bill in the, the chamber this week as well. Um, and that the, these upper, upper ability fixes are moving ahead, coming up with the, the, with the full sort of fisheries policies is going to take a couple of years. So if we get to December the 31st, if we're facing a no deal, um, and there's no agreement between the EU and the UK on this. Um, will this CFP 12, in terms of just even those, I know the language is very, very important, um, but if we're going to go into a void without having a proper policy for a number of years, potentially, um, is there is there the, the opening there? Um, for example, the STECF, you know, if we're going to be capturing data, um, where's that going? Yeah. In, in that void of two years, where's it going? Yeah, well, with these regulations in relation to the STECF, that's that's an EU body, um, yeah. the Scientific, uh, Technical and Environment Committee on Fisheries. You know, there, there'll be a replacement through these the CFP twelve to replace that reference to you know an internationally recognised body. You know, so I mean, these these regulations will be rolled over. These EU regulations that were made, certainly the the three that were referenced early on, demersal discard plans, tax and quota, and data collection. Those regulations were made by the EU in tw late 2019. So there wasn't a chance in the earlier EU exit program to, to roll those forward. So they need to be rolled forward now so that they're operational um, with the operability fixes from the end of December. And if, and if I could just add, add to that, um, obviously, uh, Claire, as you've mentioned there, the, the, the Assembly gave a legislative consent to the, the fisheries bill um, last week, and, 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 and Patrick and I and a few others worked on, worked on that also. Um, but, um, you know, as, as it was uh, made clear that that was a, is a piece of um, framework legislation, um, it provides uh, regulation-making powers, and... Uh, so that's that's if it if it receives royal assent, um, those provisions uh, will obviously extend here to Northern Ireland. But beyond that, then um, come come the start of next year, uh, then uh, we will want to be uh, starting to um, develop our own. Uh, fisheries policies, given that uh, it's a it's a devolved a devolved matter, and uh, uh, Dara will have a, a team there uh, scoping out um, all of the issues uh, in terms of uh, what might be needed uh, for that domestic fisheries uh, policy, uh, and ultimately then um, we would hope, subject to the executive's uh, agreement and its its program, um, that uh, we would be able to introduce. Um, a Northern Ireland fisheries fisheries bill. Uh, now that's uh, it's fair to say that the, the Northern Ireland fisheries bill. Uh, I think we have a marker down for that uh, in the next in, in the next mandate, um, uh, given the, the the length of time it, it takes to develop that policy and obviously to get it through 
the, the legislative process. So can I ask a last question then? Is there anything, any provisions in this SI that apply only to Northern Ireland? Um, and have you a sense of how this has also been, um, any feedback from uh, in, uh, Scotland and Wales and England in terms of their response to it? Um, certainly in terms of uh, Scotland and Wales, um, you know, uh, each of the devolved administrations um, has worked uh, very closely with with DEFRA uh, in, in in bringing uh, this particular SI SI forward. Um, so, I think certainly um, the the devolved administrations are content uh, with the oper operability fixes um, that are provided uh, provided with, within it. Sorry, Claire, what was the? Uh, uh, I've forgotten your first point there. Is there anything here that applies only to Northern Ireland? Um, and if not, is there anything here that is unique? Maybe yeah. any impacts unique to Northern Ireland? No, it's it's it's, it's a UK wide uh, SI, so it will it will apply across the, the UK. But any impacts there that will have um, specific impacts for Northern Ireland as opposed to other GB regions? No, uh, there, there wouldn't there wouldn't be. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, right, so um, we'll move on here now. So the, the question is, the committee is, um, are we content to note that the dear Minister has given his consent for the um, UK minister to lay a statutory instrument in the UK Parliament on the CFP amendments, EU exit regulation 2020, category 1? Right. Nope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tend to note, okay. Tend to note, yeah. Um, right, number 11 then, item 11, Department Oil Briefing, uh, SI DEFRA CFP 021, the Marine and Fisheries Free Trade Agreement Regulation 2020, laying date 30th November. Um, can I advise members the Department uh, has, hasn't supplied papers for this agenda item, or indicate which officials will be present for the committee meeting, uh, pack issuing. Instead, in page 88 of the pack, there's a statement that indicates that is, that is contingent on a free trade deal. Okay. Um, item 12, Departmental Oral Briefing, the Agriculture Products, Food and Drink Amendment, EU Exit Regulations 2020. Well, members, the Department hasn't supplied papers for this uh, item um, or indicated which officials will be present in time for the committee meeting pack issuing. Stella, the clerk, has subsequently been informed that this essay is likely to come to the committee next week, the 8th of October. Um, item 13, Departmental Oral Briefing, uh, DEFRA CMO 18, the Common Organisation of the Markets and Agriculture Products Miscellaneous Amendments, EU Exit Number 20 Regulations 2020. Um, the, the, again, the Department ha hasn't provided the papers for this agenda item or indicated which officials will be present um, in time for the pack issuing. And again, Stella, the clerk, has subsequently been informed that this is likely to come to the committee next week, 8th of October. And uh, again, in relation to Department Oil Briefing, SA DEFRA CFP 018, the Sea Fish Licensing England EU Exit Revocation Order 2020. Again, the, the papers have been supplied uh, for this agenda item, and or which officials will be present time for the pack and again on 88 page 88 off the pack there's a statement that indicates that while this SI refers only to England and will not come to the committee for consideration. There's also a reminder that the era committee made an equivalent SR on the 17th of February 2020. And um, item 15 is the October monitoring round and the main estimates. Uh, the Clark memo from Stella at the Clark at pages 22 to 24 of your table papers and a written briefing from the department at 25 to 37 of the table papers. I'd like to welcome by star leaf uh, David Reid, Finance Director, Roger Downey, Deputy Finance Director, and Linda Lowe, the Head of Financial and uh, uh, Planning Branch. And then following the briefing, I'll um, give members the opportunity to, um, uh, to ask some questions. So I'd like to welcome you, David, Roger, and Linda. Okay. Having technical difficulties here. Move on to the written brief, perhaps. 
back to that, if need be. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Whilst we're resolving the technical issue here, we might move on to uh, item number sixteen, which is a written briefing from the Ornamental Horticulture Industry uh, Scheme Regulation 2020. I want to refer members to the page 95-96, which is a memo from the clerk, corresponds to Department 97 to 99, the SR at pages 100 to 107, and the Hansard at pages 108 to 123. Uh, I want to uh, draw members' attention to an email which has been received, which can be found at 39 to 40 of the table papers. It outlines some concerns from a nursery grower regarding eligibility criteria that was used to allocate the funding. I want to advise members that the committee received a briefing from the department on the 20th, 1st of August, when it considered the Agriculture Commodities Coronavirus Income Support Scheme. The purpose of the ESR is to provide for a scheme of financial assistance to primary producers in the ornamental horticulture sectors. Incomes have been significantly affected by due to the uh, pandemic. The SR will be subject to the negative procedure and will come into force in October. The Department has advised that the SR will break the 21-day rule. However, this has been necessary in order to make the payments as soon as possible. Okay. Um, do members have any comments? Yeah. Okay. Um, Rosemary, you may be going to make the same comments as myself, but go first. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll let you go first. Uh -huh. No, uh, I've just... Um in contact with one or two of these folk, and they they want to, they want to know, basically, that for for businesses to qualify, sheep, sheep beef business etc., they didn't have to be registered for VAT, and yet there seems to be within the criteria here, these horticultural businesses have to be registered for VAT. VAT. Why is this? As a fair comment, I've been yeah. approached as well. I've been and approached as well, yeah, so it's, it is a fair comment, yeah. yeah. It's particularly been impacting on the uh, smaller... Yes. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I sent a letter to the Minister in relation to that. Yeah. So, as a committee, are we for, oh, can we ask that question? You know, why is it that in relation to, say, farm businesses, with the funding came out of the same pot, they, there wasn't the same requirement to be fat registered? Yeah, I'll do to ask. Think, yeah. And ask I for think, a reply for next week, I think. I'm, yeah. told, I'm told there's a number of small businesses so that will affect. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. I so will ask for a reply for, for next week. Right, right to the Minister. And, and keep this until, and, oh, and yes, keep it, yeah. until next week. Yeah. Because it's impacting on a lot of, yeah. a lot of these. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, can we come? Okay. Yeah, and I'll are you going to, what are we going to do? What have we decided on? Uh, right to the Minister? Or, or, we should get a reply for next week. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get, a, I'll get a reply from the dollar. I'll get it quicker than the minister, if yeah. you mind, yeah. 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 Um, so, do we have uh, yes. do we have Roger, David and Linda online now, yes? Okay. Okay, we'll go back now. We've agreed we'll go right to the minister in relation to that there. You know, but what, what, why, why has this really been applied to the horticulture sector and not the other okay. sectors involved from the same pot? So, uh, item 15 is in um, the October monitoring round. So, David, Roger, and Linda, um, you are very welcome. Glad to see you. So, do you want to um, do your brief and then there will be questions afterwards? Yes, um, thank you, Chair. Can I just check that everyone can hear me okay? Yep. Yes, yes. Can you hear us okay? Okay. Um Yes, yes thank I can. You. Thank you. Um, good morning, committee, and uh, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to present various proposals on the 2021 October monitoring round and the 2021 uh, main estimate today. Turning firstly to October monitoring, as you will be aware from the briefing you have received, DERA is not submitting any transactions which require executive approval, such as reclassifications, reductions, or reallocations in this round. You will also be aware that DERA proposes to declare 5.9 million of reduced capital requirements. This is largely due to the impact of COVID-19 on our ability to deliver capital projects. There are no capital grants being proposed as reduced requirements. We're proposing to bid for 1 million resource Dell in respect of common market organization. Um, this is an EU exit pressure and funding was previously provided by the Rural Payments Agency. Technical issues relates to agreed interdepartmental transfers in this round. The largest is a 1 million transfer to the Department for Communities for the Town Centre and Settlements Revitalisation Programme. 
EMI or annually managed expenditure primarily relates to issues in DERA, such as provisions, and there are two EMI transactions proposed in this round. Non-budget relates primarily to the movement in cash of arm's length bodies, and there are no material changes proposed in this round. Turning now to DERA's main estimate, the Finance Minister plans to introduce the Budget Bill, which provides the legal authority for expenditure in the main estimates to the Assembly in the week commencing on the 19th of October. I understand that you have already received a copy of DERA's main estimate schedules, and these are set out in the usual format. DERA's main, main estimate sets out proposals to incur resource expenditure of $685.2 million and drawdown cash of $664.3 million in the current financial year. The legal authority to spend departmental allocations is via the supply and budget processes. As part of the supply process, estimates, both main and spring supplementary, set out in detail the amounts of cash and that resources required for public services for one financial year for each department. The Assembly approves the estimates via the supply resolution, and the estimates are contained in the relevant budget bill. The bill also authorizes the balance on the vote on account for 2021. Chair, there is one small change to the main estimates that I wish to draw to the committee's attention. On the last page of the estimate, responsibilities of the accounting officer, there is a note to the estimates which states that the provision sought for, uh, for this year is 104% higher than the final net provision for last year. The 104% should be replaced with 107.5. The committee is therefore asked to note their main estimate. There, this concludes my summary of the department's proposals in the October monitoring round and main estimates, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Well, I suppose I'll ask the question. A note there on the uh, in relation to the AFB uh, core sites replacement 1.5 million. Um, see, see the 1.5 million, um, which is given up in October for the AFB RV car, is that in relation to the research vessel? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. No members. Any other members want to raise any issues relating to that? Okay. Yeah. Well, so I want to thank you uh, for very much for uh, that present the presentation there. Um, so, um, if we have anything to follow up, we'll, we'll be. Um, in contact with you. So members are okay to move on to the next agenda item then. Okay, so agenda item 17, uh, departmental written briefing, which is NIEA fees and charges scheme, um, uh, pages 124 to 219, that this is the annual uplift in fees uh, and charges um, and the list of individual schemes covered in this have been outlined in Annex 1 of pages 126 to 20. 127. Um, do members any questions uh, in relation to that particular item? Okay. So members content to note this, are they? Okay. Uh, we have a written brief on, on COVID-19, um, which is on page 42 to 52. Uh, it covers the Food and Farming Group, Veterinary Services, Environment, Fisheries, Rural Affairs, Central Services. Um, is, um, okay. So, any questions from members in relation to that there? Um, okay. Thank you. Um, Patrick? Hello? Yeah, Patrick. Sorry, Chair. Yeah. But I, I didn't. That, that previous item there, um, the the um, number 16. Yes, that's right. The ornamental horticultural industry yes. scheme. Yes, yes. Some of our members have been contacted about this this particular scheme, but um, I've had some people in touch with me, and their difficulty with the scheme is that they're not registered for VAT and that their turnover, their annual turnover, isn't over £85,000. And of course, you know, they can choose to register for VAT, but it, in some cases, it's not worth their while. If their turnover is, is less than eighty five thousand, so this excludes them from it. Uh, this proposed scheme, and so if we could contact the department about that particular scheme. Yeah, yeah, Patsy, that's that's uh, agreed. Yeah, no problem. That's uh, well spotted. Hey, 
Yeah, it has, been, it has been raised by a number, a number of members uh, have been contacted by, by that as well, you know, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big issue, so it is. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, okay, if members any questions in relation to the, uh, the, uh, the, see, the, uh, the, the COVID-19 update for October 2020? No, I very, we're content with that there. Okay. Um, so correspondence uh, at page 223 to 248. Uh, I want to draw your attention to page 226 from grassroots mountain bikers who are requesting a meeting with the committee to discuss its concerns on off-road trail development and approach taken by the department. Do members have any thoughts on this request? <laughs> Uh, and so, sorry, obviously declaring interest in their May constituency, but I mean I know we're busy with work, but if if uh, it was possible to fit it in, I'd be agreeable to it. Do you fancy an informal meeting? To informal meeting? Yeah. Okay. Will I try to arrange that for a Tuesday lunch time, and then whoever wants to join in by Starleaf can do so. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, have enough to. Action that corresponds is suggested on the index page of 220 to 221. Okay. Um, can I refer members to the draft forward work programme at page 250 to 256 and the additional paper which has been tabled at 60 to 61, which shows the confirmed agenda items for the meeting of the 8th and 9th of October. I refer also refer members to an email from the department to the clerk which is tabled at page 62 to 63. So do you want to brief, brief members on the forward uh, work programme and the contents of the email? Yes, um, I'm just going to very quickly look at the only date that I'm going to look at is next week, which is the, the 8th of October. Um, and just to say that uh, just the, the volume of work and how I propose that you might want to organise it and you can um, agree it or amend that to, um, proposal. So obviously we have the, the four ports are coming in at nine o'clock in the morning. And um, well, they'll be coming in by Starleaf, so they, you'll have a, a briefing from the four ports on their preparedness for EU exit. Um, you reckon that'll probably last about an hour. Um, there are then um, 13 different SIs, and they can be divided up into three groups, <laughs> 13 of them. So you have, um, they're all category two or category three. Some of them, we're, we don't know what they are yet, so they haven't been told. Um, so they can be divided up into three groups. There's one on chemicals, one on waste, and one sort of agricultural issues uh, in, in the broadest terms. So what I propose how you deal with those is that you ask for, you, you take those in those three groups, you ask for a very good, clear, written briefing on the SIs in those groups, and that you then have a short five-minute presentation from the officials on an overview of those SIs. There'll be four or five in each group. Uh, that'll allow then, say, 20 minutes for questions from members on all of them. So the questions might be mixed up, but you'll ask questions on all of them. And then at the end of that, you'll have five minutes to discuss and take a position on the four or five that you've just heard from. That would take about 45 minutes for each group, say. So that would be you into sort of like just over two hours on those on those 13 SIs. Maybe that, that goes quicker, maybe that takes slower, but that's what I'm thinking it you would need to do. Um, that you um, th there were proposals for three other oral presentations that day. One on general trade update. So you heard the fisheries update today. This one is on general the next one would be on general trade update. Then there'd be one on uh, there was there was going to be one on chemicals and there was going to be one on waste. Suggest that you you get a written briefing on chemicals and waste, and that you may want to take the general trade update or you may want to defer it. If you take the general trade update, you are probably looking at having to take all your written information, everything that is in writing, your correspondence, your minutes, everything like that, on the Friday morning. If you don't take the general trade update, there's a possibility that you could get through the business in one meeting starting at nine and finishing at about one, one thirty. But um, that's, uh, that's, um, 
your um, your propo the proposal for tomorrow or for next week. I'm, I'm taking each week at a time now. You're not going beyond yeah. <laughs> yeah. each week. Fair enough. So, um, there uh, really is your if you're happy with that general overview, your choice then is whether to take the general trade update or defer it to another day. And if you take it, then the implication is a Friday morning meeting to do all the written briefings, which you should be able to do perhaps in an, in just under an hour. And could you do the Friday morning one like a Starleaf? You could do it by Starleaf or Microsoft Teams. Yeah, you could do it informal. Take all the written briefings then. Um, you, well, obviously, the, the, Coro, uh, the ornamental horticulture one will be coming back, so we might try to slip it uh, 10, 15 minutes in for it. Yeah. yeah. So I'll probably... Okay. So do you, want to, do you want to take the general trade update and then go for Friday morning for the written briefings? Okay. Yep. Okay. General trade, yes. Okay. Um, okay. um, before I go back one second, there was, there was something that I, that I had highlighted but I'd missed it. I had a multitask here. Um, see in relation to the last update the, um, the, from the, the ministers the, from the department there, um, again, I want to come in. There's a lot of good work going on in terms of funding for the rural businesses and the micro grants, the innovation grants. Excellent. The, see, under the tackling, the report we got from the tackling, the Tripsy, um, I did I did note, uh, jumped out of me there, um, in terms of the, gr the groups that were funded through the Coronavirus Community um, Fund, um, that there were 25 organisations that were um, applied were ineligible for support, and 12 of them were rural. Now, I, I just think that's, um, I just would like to know, that seems disproportionate, you know, so I'd, I'd like to know some feedback as to why those 12 were ineligible, because um, you know, maybe it's further training that might be needed, or whatever it might be, but just it's just something that jumped out of me in the report today, if we could just, maybe just follow that up, yeah. Stella. Yeah. Okay. That's, uh, that's, Page um, 47 on the table papers. Okay. Um, so, following on the item there, I want to refer members to an, um, an item of table correspondence of 54 to 59 uh, regarding an online interactive workshop on effective questioning. This is being offered to all committees in October. The session will be for, for 90 minutes and can form part of the regular uh, weekly committee meeting or could be held on a Friday morning. Uh, can I ask uh, comments from the members on which option they prefer? Do we have the space to integrate into the committee meeting, Stella? Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose you could. Um, I would be reluctant to try and do it at the minute. It could turn out that you would have a time on the 22nd of October, but um, you might want to look at November, maybe. Would members November prefer to try to keep? The, the area committee business on a Thursday, would that be? And then maybe do it on a yeah. Friday. Yeah, yeah. Friday, Friday. You want to do it on a Friday morning? It's a one off, we could do it on a Friday morning. It's one off, on Friday morning, whatever. Yeah, okay. Is there, uh, can I ask members then, um, the, say Friday the, the 16th, would that be? I don't think that's good for me. Okay. Then the uh, Friday the 23rd, I'm out that morning as well. <laughs> so then we're where we are, and then the thirtieth is is the is is um, reset. Um, um, I was going to say recession. Uh, I make mis I definitely make myself coming. <laughs> so at the minute, so the sixth of November. Sixth of November. First thing. Yes, nine yeah, o'clock. You should be finished at half ten. Yep. Uh-huh. That's Friday, sixth of November. Okay. Okay. So uh, we'll note that down, okay? So um, okay, under AOB, uh, Claire has indicated that uh, she has an item that she wished to raise regarding a written briefing on shared uh, environmental services uh, to cover its statutory responsibilities, functions, role and remit management structure, operations, staffing level, and budget, funding, and finances. Um, Claire, um, do you want to want to speak about that, Claire? Or? Yeah, um, it's just 
I don't know how anybody else is feeling, but um, I'm a bit confused about how to contact um, people within this department, how the department is operationally working. So um, shared environmental services is something that has come up to my attention in recent times as well, and trying to find out who they are, what they do, who they're connected to, where their sort of management process lies. And I just think it would be useful if um, we could get a written briefing. I know that we can't call them in for um, just any sort of oral briefings due to workloads, but if we could get a written briefing as to who they are, what they do, where they work from, what their roles, responsibilities, um, where their finance, uh, staff management all comes from, I think that would be really helpful for me. Um, and just putting it out to see if anybody else in the committee would feel the same. Yep. You know, I'm going to ask the question, well, I think it's councils. It's councils. It's based in Bollywood, aren't it? Uh -huh. Or Antrim, I think. So, yeah. so why did they have an office there? But as far as I'm aware, again, they are part of the NIEA, um, who are, as it's a team within there that have been set up to work with councils. So it's just to sort of get all that clear. John? Yeah, totally in agreement uh, so, so that we have a, a, an oversight of it. But I think part of that oversight, I'm sure, to every degree, would be to try and get information as well on the consistency and return of services post COVID, post lockdown. Um, I'm not sure that, that all areas have returned all individual services at the same rate. And I, I think uh, as detailed an oversight of that as possible, area by area, would also be useful. Yeah. Okay, so we're content to ask this written briefing. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's quite difficult to get information out of them. So. <laughs> Okay. So members can. Chair, is it possible to um, just ask from the the department, maybe the permanent secretary, if that he can supply like a, a sort of a management plan uh, from the department? Um, so the names and the contacts of who are the lead within each sort of area within the department? Because I still struggle to say, I know that we get people coming and giving us the briefing, but you know, unless I'm keeping a record of who they are and how to get in touch with them from committee packs, I don't know who to contact where within the department itself as well. And I know that I've been supplied that previously with other committees, and I'm just wondering if we could have it for this one. I don't think anybody will disagree with getting more information on how, do, how we should interface with them and get more details. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. Okay, um, so uh, is there any else I want to raise before we turn? So, next meeting will take place 30th of October at 9 here. Um, okay, in room 30, so I'll adjourn the meeting. Okay, so we're going to close session now. Oh, okay. Just okay. Closed. We're just closed. It there. Um, so we're just finished. No. Members, we're now going to close session yeah. and could ask. Yeah. We don't need to. We've, we've done everything we needed to. Well, so. Have we? Yeah. Very good. So as the communications. <laughs> so so we're adjourned. I'm sure we'll see us all back here next week. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's it. Are, are we still going ahead on? Is it Tuesday? Is it the House of Lords guys? Uh, the sixth. Yeah. In the sixth. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's it. All right. Yes. Oh, that's good. That's okay. And, and an information pack's been put together for you, Pat. That's good. Thanks very much. Okay, Lord Thanks. McLone. Okay, Lord, Lord McLone. <laughs> A bomb there. Lord. See you, Pat. See you all the best. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.